So uh, you may be thinking, why is this happening right now? Um, Passover is in a week and uh, maybe you have a kitchen to clean or a Seder to prepare for, or um, you are thinking through how to spiritually cleanse yourself of the chametz in our lives. Um, that doesn't necessarily equal in our own minds uh, sitting down and studying Talmud. Um, but that is exactly what we're we're doing today. And that is really also part of the goal of uh, our book that just was released. And I'll put a link in the comments. Um, but this Highlights of Tractate Pesachim is a compilation of all of the daily essays that uh, we set, sent out um, on the uh, Tractate of Pesachim, which of course is related and not related to our practice. And we will speak more about that uh, today. So um, without further ado, thank you all for writing in the chat. It's lovely to see you here. Um, we are joined by Dr. Rachel Scheinerman, Rabbi Elliot Goldberg, and Rabbi Lauren Tuckman. Um, they will be speaking about the four questions of the Seder, um, Magid, or the storytelling aspect of the Seder, as well as Hallel, um, which are traditional uh, words of praise. It, it uh, um is also part of our Passover Seder. Um, and so each will present for a few minutes and we will uh, transition from one to the next. At the end, we will have time for questions. So if you are um, hearing from Rachel or from Elliot or from Lauren, and there's a question that's you just need to get out, feel free to write to me in the chat and I will make note of it. Um, and uh, we will see at the end how we can bring this all together, bring through, um, sort of tie a thread through these three presentations um, and hopefully leave today thinking maybe different about the Talmud and maybe differently about Passover. Um, so on that note, I will turn it over to Rachel. Okay, thank you, Mara. I wanted to just, if I don't, if you don't mind, I just want to say one or two more words about this book that's the occasion for our meeting today. Um, Rabbi Goldberg and Rabbi Tuckman are both authors in this book. What this book is, is a series of very short essays on each single page of the Talmudic tractate on Passover. And it was produced uh, over the course of the cycle of reading the Talmud some years ago. And it was never, we never originally imagined that we would turn this into a book. And so a lot of kudos to Mara, who took a lot of the initiative in our company to turn it into an actual printed book. I, I've spent my whole publishing life doing online things. This is the actual first like physical thing that I've been involved in that's been published. So it's really um, a lovely, lovely thing to have. And we hope it will be a nice companion uh, if you're interested in purchasing it and checking it out. A uh, nice companion for you in delving more deep, more deeply into um, what the Talmud has to say about Passover, and what what the idea of this session is is to give you a kind of taste of the kinds of things that are in here in these. Um, how many essays? One hundred and twenty. How many pages? One hundred nineteen or so. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we've each picked an aspect of the Seder to talk about, and I am going to talk about the four questions, which is a favorite topic of mine. And I hope that this presentation will be both a little intellectually interesting and a little practically interesting for you and your Seder. So I've um, got a presentation. I'm gonna put that into the uh, chat here. And I'm also going to share my screen. Oh, I need permission, Mara, to do that. Unless you would like to share the presentation, that's fine too. I um I just gave you permission and people are asking to see a page from the book. So I just randomly uh found a page and here you can find the essays very beautifully laid out. Um we had a great graphic designer on our team. Um and uh as is similar in um our email essays, uh the um verses that are from uh the Talmud are uh, bolded and, and in a different style. So it's quite easy to read and we hope you enjoy. Okay. 
Thank you. All right, so let's talk about the four questions in the Talmud. All right, four questions. Uh, one of the most iconic rituals of the Seder, uh, one that people tend to remember and wake up for and get excited about. And usually, hopefully, maybe you're lucky enough to have a very cute child who will stand on their chair and ask the questions. Or perhaps you're in one of those households where it's the same cousin who was a very cute child 25 years ago, who's still stuck with asking these questions until the next generation comes along and relieves them of the duty. But it is kind of a, a strange ritual, right? Why do we have, why do we ask kids to memorize these very specific questions, usually that they already know the answers to? If this is an educational endeavor, like why? Why would we do this? So, so the point of my 15 minute presentation is to give you a sense of where this ritual originates from. And by the way, to tell you that it that what I've all everything I've just said about it so far is wrong. It's not actually four questions at all. So that's my first my first point. It's not the four questions, complete misnomer. They're not actually questions at all. Here's how I would translate them. Okay. And I I call them the Manish Tana. Those are the first two words. And that, that relieves me of having to call them the four questions, right? Okay. So here's how I would translate the Manish Tana. How different is this night from all other nights? It's an observation. Even an ecstatic, an, an enthusiastic observation, but an observation. This is just very different, right? That's pretty self-evident. And then there are a few more points to support this observation, right? On all other nights, we eat chametz or matzah, you know, whatever we want, leavened bread, unleavened bread, but tonight only matzah. And what do you know? On all their nights, we eat other vegetables, but tonight we only eat maror, the bitter herbs. And on all other nights, we don't dip our food. That's not our standard practice, but tonight we dip twice. And on all their nights, we can eat sitting up or we can recline. Tonight we recline, okay? No questions. No questions at all, just statements. Just statements about what's going on at the Seder. All right, so what is this ritual? Where does it come from? Um, there, let's ask a real question. Why, 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 why does it look this way? What is it about? Okay, um, the ritual um, derives from the Torah, which tells us four times that you're to teach your children about the Exodus. A lot of people know that, and a lot of people know that this is the the this is behind the ritual of the four sons, the idea of four different kinds of children who need different kinds of answers, ask different kinds of questions and need different kinds of answers, four different personalities, and a reminder to satisfy different personalities at the Seder. Um, but I want to look at something different here in these four cases in which the Torah tells us to instruct our children about the Exodus. And notice that in three of those cases, the Torah is really explicit. It says, your child will ask, right? Exodus 12, 26. And when your children ask you, what is the, what is, what do you mean by this, right? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord, right? And again, Exodus 13, 14, a child of yours asks, Deuteronomy 6, 20, your children ask. The Torah is really explicit that children are going to ask, okay? And the rabbis understand from this that the asking is a really important part of the ritual. Not just the telling, but the asking. And so they, so they worry about what will happen if you have a child at the table who doesn't ask, who just sits there and has a good time and doesn't ask any questions. How can we fulfill the Torah's requirement that we ask? We, we need the child to ask as an introduction to teaching. So this is what the Mishnah says they, uh, in describing the Seder. They mix the cup and here the child asks. And if the child is unable to ask, his father teaches him. How different is this night from all other nights? On all other nights, we dip once, but on this night, we dip twice. On all other nights, we eat chametz and matzah. On this night, only matzah. On all other nights, we eat our meat roasted or boiled. On this meat night, all the meat is roasted. 
So you may recognize here that this is an early version of the Manish Tana. It's not exactly the same as the one we say, right? There's some key differences. First off, there are only three observations about what's going on at the table, not four. And we are missing the observation about reclining and we're missing the observation about bitter herbs. And instead we have an observation about the roasted meat. That's the meat of the Paschal sacrifice. Um, but nonetheless, this is very similar to what we recite, the Manish Tana. And notice that it is definitely not questions, right? Because the Mishnah told us after we pour the second cup of wine, the child asks the question. And if you have a kid who doesn't ask, this is a script you can use to get the child to ask, right? This is something that the parent says. It's not a question, and it's designed to provoke questions from the children. The rabbis are not imagining children ask this at all. They're imagining that the adult asks this question. Uh, sorry, doesn't ask. Recites this formula. It's, it's words for the adult to try and get questions out of the kid, child. So we've gone from sort of the Torah's um, imagining of the ritual as something fairly spontaneous where of course kids are just gonna ask and when they ask, you're gonna answer them to the rabbis, understanding that to mean that asking is essential. And if kids don't ask, we need to find a way to get them to ask. And if and the way to get them to ask is to recite this formula. Now we're gonna jump um, to the Talmud and see this formula in practice in the pages of the Talmud. I've brought two short excerpts for you. Okay. So this is from Tractate Pesachim, which is what this book is about. And, um, and here, I, I will just go ahead and read and explain. Rav, the, imagine we're sitting at, at a Passover meal. Rav Shimi Bar Ashi said, one shall remove the table only from before the one reciting the Haggadah. Why does one remove the table? The school of Rabbi Yanai say, so that the children will notice that something is unusual and they will ask. Okay, so this is this is a little different. We have some something about removing the table. Um, so let me just pause to explain what that means for a minute. In, in ancient times, uh, in, in the rabbinic, style of dining that the rabbis did in ancient times, they didn't tend to have big dining tables the way we did. It uh, was more common for each diner to have a little stand in front of them, and then a tray with their personal food was brought and placed in front of each diner, and that was called the table. So it, it's almost like, imagine TV tray tables. Everybody's got their own individual table. So what Rav Shimi Bar Ashi is saying is um, before reciting the Haggadah, before Magid, you whisk away all the food. Why do you do that? To get the attention of the children and get them to ask. It's another ploy. It's another ploy to get the children's attention, to, to point out, to make, this is not pointing out what's weird about the night, but actually doing something weird just to get their attention so they will ask so we can fulfill the Torah's um, commandment that the children shall ask. And now we have a little anecdote. I'm, I'm gonna read from the second paragraph on your screen now. Abaye was sitting before Rabbah when he was still a child. He saw that they were removing the table from before him. And he said to those removing it, hey, we've not yet eaten and you're taking the table away. Rabbah said to him, aha, you have exempted us from reciting Manish Tana. Okay, we have a story about Abai the sage when he was a little boy sitting at the Passover Seder of Rava, and he sees them do this. They remove the table and it, it does exactly what they're hoping, which is it causes Abai to ask a question. It's not really a question about the Exodus, but it's a question nonetheless, and it satisfies the rabbi's desire to have the child ask a question at the table. And I think Rabbi's answer here is really funny. He says, ah, you have exempted us from having to recite Manish Tana. Now that you have asked this question, little Abaye, we are exempted from having to say, we, the grown-ups, don't have to say Manish Tana anymore. Thank you. You get the feeling that the grown-ups 
found this a little stilted, or at least that's my read on it. Um, let's look at one more case of this in action from the Talmud, just a page later, okay? Different, different cast of characters. Now it's Rav Nachman, and he's having Seder with his servant or slave, Daru. And Rav Nachman says to his servant, a slave who is freed by his master, who gives him gold and silver, what should the slave say to him? And Daru, the slave says to him, he must thank and praise his master. Rav Nachman said to him, ah, you have exempted us from having to recite Manish Tana. So this is also an interesting um, version of what the rabbis are talking about here. Right now, we don't have a child. We have a slave instead. We know that the rabbis thought of slaves in a similar category as children, and apparently that satisfies the Torah requirement for them. And in this case, Rav Nachman prompts the slave by asking him a question. And when Daru gives the right answer, that seems to be enough of an educational exchange that uh, Rav Nachman feels we have answered the central question of Passover, which is which is which is that we must thank and praise God for the redemption. Okay, so how did we get from Manish Tana being a series of statements that the parent asks if they need to, only if they need to, to wake up a sleepy child and get them to ask a question to ensure that we have an educational exchange at the Seder, to being this ritualized thing where the child recites the Manish Tana. How did the parents manage to shove this over onto the child? I don't know, but I have a guess. Okay, this is this is a one version of the contemporary Haggadah from um, the Eidot HaMizrach. And here's what it here's what it says. We pour the second cup and remove the dish as if we are done eating so the children will wonder and ask. Sound familiar? That should now sound familiar because you've read it in the Talmud, right? This idea of removing the, in the Talmud it said remove the table. That doesn't make sense in, in, in more contemporary times when we don't actually haul, when we eat on one big communal table and we don't have individual tables, but we remove the dish. So that's what it says, we remove the dish. So the children will wonder and ask. And then the Haggadah goes straight to the four questions. How different is this night from all other nights? Because on all other nights we eat chametz and matzah, tonight only matzah, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what's going on here, I think, is what is originally intended behind this text is that there should be, maybe maybe it would be helpful to have one more line of instruction, which says, if the children don't ask, the parent should say the following, right? We know that from the Mishnah and from the Talmud, that that's sort of what the rabbis intended. If the child doesn't ask, then the parent says the following. But that instruction is missing. And with the word ask lingering right on top of the Manish Tanah, it looks like the Manish Tana are what the children are supposed to ask. And I think this has sort of generated the whole interpretation that these are four questions and that the children should ask them rather than the parents should say them. Um, okay, so, so just to sort of uh, conclude and not take too much, I hope I haven't taken too much of the time here. The question then is, are we doing the Manish Tana right? I mean, we do do it differently than the rabbis suggest. Um, but I'm not here to tell anybody to not do Manish Tana the way that you did it last year and the way that you did it as children, or anything like that. This is obviously a well-established and well-beloved Jewish ritual at this point. But what I want to say is if Manish Tana is beginning to feel a little bit stale for you, if you don't have an adorable small child to ask this and make it a beautiful moment at your Seder, I would, I would suggest that this Talmudic conversation is an opportunity to think a little bit more creatively about the ritual now that we understand what it's really about, that it's really about trying to elicit a pedagogical exchange and that the rabbis were open to that happening in any number of ways, including just by yanking the food off the table. So um, this is me wishing you all a really meaningful and wonderful Seder with lots of good questions and lots of good conversation. And let me let me make sure there's time for my colleagues here. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, we'll just give 
uh, Rabbi Elliot a moment um, to uh, get his presentation ready and uh, we can, I think, stop sharing your screen now. Great. Um, thank you, Polly, for the clapping. Uh, we love it. We love an applause. Um, and uh, again, thank you to those who are um, writing in the chat um, your questions. We do hope to have time to answer some or all of them at the end. So keep them coming. I muted myself. Go ahead, Rabbi. Okay. Um, building on a theme, um, we we think of we're we're we, before Rachel's presentation. We might have thought that there were questions and then there's an answer. <laughs> um, but if and it doesn't make sense to read the Haggadah that way. Um, but. Uh, what I, I'm picking up where she left off, right? We want children to ask questions about what's going on tonight so that we have the educational opportunity to tell them the story of Passover. Um, and what I'm gonna focus on is uh, what comes next in the Haggadah, the Magid se section, which is about um, what the rabbis think should be part of the story that we tell. Um, and I saw a comment before while Rachel was presenting that says, it's curious that there's not necessarily a specific explanation in the Haggadah of any of the specific statements of the things we notice that are different in the Manishtana. Um, and there are lots of things we can explain, and, but I think there's no specific answer to the direct statements about it. Here's what's different tonight from the other night and why, because it's not about the details. The rabbis want us to focus on some general principles when we tell the story of why we're gathered for the Seder. And what uh, I would love to share with you is um, a little bit about what the, the Talmud has to say about that. So I just put a link to my slides in the chat, but I'm gonna share my screen as well so you can see them on the screen, but you'll have access to them um, now or later. Here comes the screen sharing and the start of the slideshow. I just froze. We see and hear you. We don't see your screen yet. Yeah, my computer seems like <laughs> you could. So you could see I me. Mean, my computer screen has just frozen when I tried to share the slideshow. Um, I can share it uh, for you. Okay. Um, so, but you'll need to to stop share for a minute. Uh, all right. Uh, wait, I got it. My computer caught up. Okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, he says he has it, but then he went poof. Um, okay, we'll give him just a minute to come back. And I'll get his slides ready. Great. Do, 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 do. Okay, we're here. Awesome. Okay. All right, I'm back. <laughs> My slide started and then it kicked me off of Zoom and then I unmuted. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, sorry for the technical problem. All right, so uh, Mara, you can go to the next slide. Awesome. Okay. Um, so if you want to know what you're supposed to do at the Seder, what's the story we're supposed to tell? Once the kids have noticed what's different about this night and say what's going on that we're doing all these different things, it comes down to four things. Um, I want to share these four things with you, and we're going to dig into two of them. The first one that the Mishnah says we're supposed to do is we begin with disgrace and conclude with glory. Uh, some advice about the story we're going to tell, what we do when we're telling the story, begin with disgrace and conclude with glory. 
Um, not necessarily clear from this phrase what this means from the Mishnah, but the rabbis in the Gemara later are going to explain, and I'll circle back to that in a moment. Um, second, uh, we expound from the passage, right? We explain the passage from Deuteronomy 26. My father was a wandering Aramean until we complete the uh, entire section of the biblical text. You might be thinking to yourself, well, it might sound familiar if you know the Haggadah, but you might be thinking to yourself, the story of Passover appears mostly in the book of Exodus. Say for Shemot, why are we using a text from the book of Deuteronomy to tell the story? We're going to dig in that in a moment. Third thing, Rabban Gamliel says, if you don't talk about three things at the Seder on Passover, you haven't fulfilled your obligation. Here they are, the Passover lamb, matzah, and the bitter herbs. And number four, in each and every generation, a person must view themselves as though they personally left Egypt. There's a proof text for that from uh, the book of Exodus. Um, so once people notice, or the kids notice, or maybe Daru the servant, or Abaye, the young Abaye, or Abaye the rabbi say, hey, something weird's going on here tonight. What's different? This night is different. What's happening? To answer that general question or to tell the story of Passover, you have to do these four things according to the Mishnah. Start with disgrace, conclude with glory. Explain a particular passage from Deuteronomy. Mention three symbols, the Passover lamb, the matzah, and the bitter herbs, and explain what they're for. And you have to imagine yourself as part of the story. What I love about this text is pretty straightforward and simple um, and potentially short. Um, we live in an age where, well, there are two trends. One, because of publication, there are many, many, many Haggadot. So when you're telling the story and using a text to do it, we have more choices than at any other time in Jewish history, right? Go online and Google Haggadot or go to a bookstore. You, you have so many options. So on some level, we have lots of ways to tell the story. But many of the ways that we try to tell the story are influenced by uh, Maxwell House. Because uh, um, you may be old enough to remember this, or you might not be. But once upon a time, when you bought your kosher Passover Maxwell House coffee, in, in the packaging came the Maxwell House Haggadah, which over time became the standard North American text um, and translation of the Haggadah for English speakers. You might have grown up in a household that used the Maxwell House Haggadah. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, my great aunt and uncle who hosted the Seder uh, had many a Maxwell House Haggadah. And um, in some ways it standardized the text. But if you look at the original, the earliest source that tells us what we're supposed to do at Pesach, we're just supposed to do these four things. And it doesn't have the fixed text that became the text that we're used to using. Uh, but these are the four things that we have to do. Um, what I'd love to do is dig into the first two a little bit, and then um, I'm going to pass things on. And, and I'm going to do the two backwards so that maybe you'll say, why is he doing it backwards? And then I could say, because I want to explain to you about what it is that Passover Seder is about. We do things a little differently so that you ask questions. But I'm going to look at number two and then number one. Uh, Mara, will you advance the slide, if you would, please? Thank you. Um, in order to understand why uh, Deuteronomy 26 is the basis of the Seder, we have to go and look at the Mishnah, where it's talking about Bikurim, which is the bringing of first fruits. Uh, 50 days after Passover comes the holiday of Shavuot, where uh, we mark the giving of the Torah. But uh, in the Bible and the Mishnah, it's also seen as a, um, an agricultural holiday. And it's an agricultural holiday. Uh, at which farmers brought the first fruits of their new crops to the temple. And as a part of that ceremony, look what happens. While the basket was still on their shoulder, they, the bringers of the baskets of Bikurim of first fruits, recite from Deuteronomy 26.3 until they complete the whole passage. Or Rabbi Judah says, until my father was a wandering Aramean. If you notice, that's the verse we saw before in the Mishnah of Alphazim. And when you reach my father was a wandering airman. You take your basket off your shoulder and hold its edges, and the priest puts their hand on it, and you wave the crops together. And then you continue, says Rabbi Yehuda, and finishing the passage. And then you deposit the basket at the side of the altar. You bow, and you leave. 
That was the ceremony, the ceremony at Shavuot of bringing crops. Um, used this passage that the rabbis say is also part of the Passover storytelling. Um, if you look at the next Mishnah, I think there's a hint of why that might be. Originally, it tells us the Mishnah, everyone who knew how to recite the passage did so on their own. And those who didn't know how to recite, others would prompt for them and they would repeat the words. In other words, when you got to the temple and it was your turn, if you knew the verse by heart, you could recite it and move forward. And if you didn't know the verse by heart, someone would say a few words and you would repeat it. They'd sort of prompt the words and you would repeat. And there, um, and that would um, uh, be the way that you would be able to recite the, uh, the passage. Uh, but when they refrained from bringing first fruits because of this, there became a change. In other words, people who couldn't recite the verses on their own and had to be prompted stopped coming to the temple because they were embarrassed that uh, they had to be prompted while other people didn't. And the rabbis decided, they made a decree that we should prompt everybody, both those who could recite the text and those who could not recite the text to make it there be equal access. And whether you knew the text by heart or it was easy for you to recite or not, um, it would be prompted for you. So I want you to imagine with me uh, a hot Shavuot afternoon, right, in uh, late spring, but already hot summer weather in Jerusalem, standing on the steps of the temple, waiting in line with your produce, where what you hear all afternoon while you wait for your turn is the priest or someone else prompting the deliverer of Bikurim and that person repeating it over and over and over again until it's your turn to do the ritual the same way. And I have to imagine that in the temple period, um, if you didn't know this verse by heart to be able to recite it before you brought your Bikurim, that the process of standing there in line year after year after year made it so that it was much more universal that people knew these verses by heart. And it strikes me that, um, that when it came to the Passover Seder and what version of the Passover story are we going to use as the basis of the telling of the story in the Haggadah, we went to this text. It's really only five or six verses. You, you could uh, look it up, Deuteronomy 26 on Safari. You could look in the Haggadah. You'll see it there. But it becomes the basis for the telling of the story of Passover. Um, the fact that it's shorter, even though there's some explanations in the Haggadah about it that lengthens the time it takes, it's probably better than reading and studying the whole book of Exodus, which might take more time than you and your family have patience for that Passover. But perhaps um, this clue about Shavuot uh, tells us something about why we choose these verses to tell the story about Passover, as opposed to others um, when we gather uh, for Passover at our, at our family tables. That's one piece about the telling of the story. Can we, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, back to point number one, the most cryptic thing in the Mishnah. One begins with disgrace and concludes with glory. It's not clear exactly what that means. And the Gemara, uh, the Babylonian Talmud, I'm page 116, side B, asks, what does the Mishnah mean when it says with disgrace? Like, what, what is this? We get two answers. Rob says, what's disgrace? At first, our forefathers were idol worshipers. And Shmuel says, we were slaves. Two short answers, and this language might echo with you right at first, uh, because it, these phrases appear in the Haggadah. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the rabbis in the Talmud and the Gemara think about, well, when we start the story of Passover from a place of disgrace, what is that disgrace? What might it be? And based on what the disgrace is, it might define what the glory is and might nuance what you're telling of the Passover story is. So Rob's version of the Passover story starts with the notion that once upon a time, we were idol worshipers. He doesn't spell out the rest, but um, what follows from that is if our, our disgrace was that we were idol worshipers, the space for glory um, is that uh, because of Passover, uh, we turned our attention to worship God. We started as idol worshipers, but because of Passover and its story, uh, we now serve God. And that's the glory that we experience and feel it. Okay? Shmuel tells a different telling of the story. Um, what's the disgrace of Passover? The disgrace is that we were slaves, that we were um, in bondage, that we had to serve um, Paro in Egypt. Um, and then what's the glory that comes with that? The glory of that is that... Um, we're taken out of slavery to become free 
also to be able to serve God. Two different versions of the story of Passover. Um, the mission in its vague language allows for both, and the Talmud records for us these two different tales. And if we were to write the story of Passover, each of these frames would give us a different verbiage, different language with which to tell the story. Um, and you might say, uh, before Maxwell House standardized the Haggadah, or maybe the Gemara did a little more, you have the option to tell either one. Or perhaps you might have your own version of disgrace and your own version of dis glory when you think about the story to tell. Um, as, happen, as, as it happens, um, for many things about Pesach, or many things about practice in general, the Gemara sometimes gives us two possible answers, and one common response to having two choices is, uh, let's do both. So next slide, please. Um, you'll see these two, and if you go to your Haggadah, you'll see these two sections. In the Magid section, which is the telling of the story of Passover, there are different tellings. One that starts, we were slaves to Pharaoh in the land of Egypt, and the Lord our God took us from there with a strong hand and outstretched arm, right? From slavery to freedom, from servitude to uh, uh, the miracles that take us out of Egypt. Um, and the second version, from the beginning, our ancestors were idol worshipers, and now God has brought us close that we may serve God. Um, a second telling also in the Haggadah that says our ancestors were idol worshipers, and now... Um, we serve God. And both of these appear in the telling of our story. And if you're leading a Seder, or even if you're participating in a Seder, uh, I might challenge you to look, to follow along in the Magid section, to notice how these two themes appear um, in the Seder. And perhaps if you look closely, you might find there's one or two more um, that don't appear in the Gemara, but have crept their way into our liturgy. So uh, to recap, the telling of the story of Passover Right, the essence of what we're gathered to do, although there are many steps to the Seder built around it, um, requires us to tell the story from uh, 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 disgrace to glory. We're supposed to use a passage from Deuteronomy that once upon a time in the temple period, probably everybody knew really well. Now we might know it less well, but it's still in the Passover Seder. Still know it. Um, that's two. There are three symbols we have to talk about. Uh, matzah, mar, right? The bitter herb, matzah, and the Passover lamb. But uh, um, you have to come back to another session to hear about those. Um, and the the fourth piece is you got to read yourself into the story. Also a lesson for another day. Um, but when you get to the end of Magid, you should be filled with joy for freedom from bondage and our ability to serve God, which leads us to the next thing you're supposed to do, which will uh, allow me to turn over the. The, the screen uh, to Rabbi Tuckerman and her presentation, which follows nicely right after. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, and uh, now over to Rabbi Lauren Tuckman to, um, I don't know if we'll, we'll hear Hallel in any way or we'll, if she'll be singing at all, um, but uh, we will hear about words of praise. Thank you so much. And I would totally sing Halal, except that Zoom and singing often do not go well together. So I am that I want you to, as I'm as I'm speaking, uh, think about all the melodies of Halal that you may or may not know um, and in, in your mind. And there are some really just beautiful settings. So to um invite actually if we could load up Mishnah um K and Vav from the 10th chapter of Psachim, which is known as Arve Psachim. Um, I'll be doing a little bit of speaking about those Mishnayot, and I'm really going to talk a bit more broadly about Hallel um, as a particular kind of liturgical unit and the ways in which saying Hallel at the Seder is very different than saying Hallel other times of the year. So as Rabbi Goldberg was just describing, right, there are different aspects to the telling and we're going from degradation to praise. Um, and the way we do that ritually and liturgically is through the recitation of Hallel. And Hallel are six Psalms, Psalms 113 through 118. What's interesting, and this really gets discussed in the sixth Mishnah of the 10th chapter of Psachim, um, is that we actually don't say all of Hallel at once. We actually break Hallel into two parts. 
And we don't actually say the bracha that we normally would say on Hallel to open it, but we do say the bracha to close Hallel. And there are other, there are a couple of other really interesting pieces that I'll bring in. And the Mishnah that discusses why is it that we only say part of Hallel before the meal and we finish Hallel after the meal, there's a whole long technicality around the bracha we say. It's a very lengthy bracha about redemption, really re-encapsulates um, Magid. So we're going to put the bracha to the side for now, but I encourage you at the Seder to, um, to really think about that bracha and what that bracha is conveying and why it is where it is. Today, I'm just going to talk about Hallel and its function. Hallel is thought of as exclusively praise. It's six psalms, that form a liturgical unit. And it actually is a section of Psalms that in many ways is not only about praise, it's actually an incredibly uh, complicated emotional experience. Um, often, I don't know if this is true for you, but often at a Seder, if I'm hosting or if I'm participating, sometimes we'll really get into the parts before the meal and then after the meal, it tends to be a silent recitation. I really want to encourage folks to allow yourselves the beautiful joy and gift actually of after the meal, really inviting folks back into this, into this religious experience and really inviting folks to sing these um, words, because the rabbis were imagining that experientially we were moving from a place of constriction to a place of expanse. And there's a very famous pasuk, there's a very famous verse in Hallel that really talks about that. From the narrows, I called out to you and you answered me from a great expanse. Um, there are there's some other really beautiful verses in Hallel. And Hallel liturgically, as I said, um, stands for a sense of praise. It's our way of expression. And something that I think is really interesting to kind of dovetail off of what Rabbi Goldberg was just discussing is that one of the things that I often say to my students whenever I'm teaching Gemara or I'm teaching Mishnah is that the rabbis assume that you know Tanakh by heart. The rabbis assume that you know the entire Hebrew Bible by heart, because that probably was the case for a lot of folks. And it's not the case for many of us, maybe not any of us. So we find ourselves having to go back and look things up and get a sense of the context. But in the context of when the Haggadah came into being initially and how the Mishnah, particularly in the 10th chapter, um, which we've all been focusing on today, really talks about the creation of the Seder and all of the different component pieces. Imagine a scenario in which the um, Tanaim, the rabbis who compiled the Mishnah, understood or assumed, based on their context, that be known by heart and it would make complete sense that it would be said in this way. And there are a couple of pieces to that that I think are really uh, interesting. One of which, of course, is that there are two opinions in the Mishnah about how much of halal you say before the meal and how much of halal you say after we follow Rabbi, we follow Rabbi Hillel. And I'm going to put that aside because that's a lot of technicality that I think um, we can dig into in another session. So I'm going to instead focus on the unique particularity of saying halal at the Seder. First of all, typically speaking, halal is not said at night. Of course, the fact that the Seder is at night is like the entire point of the religious experience, right? We left Mitzrayim, Bachipazon, in great haste. Of course, we're going to hold the Seder, the commemorative experience of that leave, um, in the evening or even in the uh, nighttime hours when it would have happened. It's a it's a reenactment. It's as we just talked about, we have to imagine ourselves deeply into the story. It's not something that happened to our ancestors. It happened to all of us. So when we actually reenact, this is extremely religiously significant. And bearing that in mind, the fact that the Psalms are put in here I think tells us a couple of interesting ritual things. One of the things I think it it tells us is that the Torah and the Haggadah both really extol someone who spends a lot of time on Magi. Like the more you talk about Yitziat Mitzrayim, the more praiseworthy you are. The more you engage in these praises to Hashem, the more praiseworthy you are. So 
In that sense, you could imagine a scenario where somebody's taken, you know, hours on Maggi, because I, I, I have friends that I know for a fact their Seder ends at five in the morning, and they, you know, they eat their, they do their Shulchan Aruch, they make sure they have, you know, make sure they have the Afikomen uh, at the right time, you have to eat the Afikomen before Halakhic midnight, Um what you need, right? You have as long as you want to sing, to have the last cup of wine, to really engage in halal. It's something that one could experience, experientially imagine that people would actually sit around the table, you know, having had plenty of food and drink, really engaging in this spiritual practice of praise. Um, recognizing that I think for many of us, if not all of us, it's not accessible for any number of reasons unless you are in a very particular kind of state. We have to find ways to make halal something that really comes alive. I've often suggested that people can choose melodies that they love and they can offer them and that can be planned in advance so that you kind of, you're not, you don't have those um, weird moments in between verses of halal where you're thinking, is somebody going to jump in? Is somebody not going to jump in? Um, we can, you know, you can invite folks to learn new melodies and to really get comfortable with them. I think that there's incredible value in that. And there are so many beautiful settings of them that um, if you just go to Spotify or to YouTube and you you put in any number of things, um, lots of things will pop up, lots of really beautiful modern settings to different verses of Hallel. I am sure somebody's probably created a playlist or two or three that have a lot of Hallel melodies. And it's a way to invite a different kind of experiential practice. With Magid, we are very much, we're supposed to be thinking about it in a multi-layered way, in a multi-sensory way, right? That we are, in fact, as the Mishnah says, we are to imagine ourselves, we are to see ourselves as if we ourselves went out of Egypt. In every generation, we are to see ourselves as if we went out from Egypt. A lot of us actually find that's very difficult and probably call the home air all the more so this year. And so I think that there's something beautiful about the rabbis engaging us in multiple forms of practice. You might find that the magi just kind of drags and um, now that we have a beautiful primer on why Deuteronomy 26 is the foundation of it, that can help illuminate that for many of our cedar guests who may not have a background or may be very confused as to why that is the foundation. But you might have people who, in the table that really, really love singing. And for those folks, this can be a really great opportunity for participation. It can be a really great opportunity to embody and um, really get into the Psalms. Um, and one of the beautiful things that Rav Shai Helm says about the Psalms um, is that the Psalms are really encompassing of the totality of human experience. Really everything is in there. And that is true of Hallel as a unit as much as it is true of Psalms as a whole. So I think it's important to also remember that as we are engaging in these praising and, um, you know, exaltation and just gratitude for freedom, we don't forget at all that actually things are very tough. Things are hard. We find ourselves in very low places. And to have a real mature and well-rounded spiritual grounding I think we are invited into acknowledgement of all of that, even and especially at the Seder, because we know that the, the Seder is the beginning of what created us as a nation, and it is an opportunity for us to really bring all of the pieces of ourselves into the space, and we don't leave any of that out, right? We find ways to ritually integrate it in ways that allow it to be there and to be present. And that is really what I hope for all of you as you um, engage with Halal this year, that it becomes not just a silent rote exercise or something that gets skipped because the meal is ending and people are tired, but it's actually an opportunity to really engage in a different kind of practice. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And I'm going to now um, add the rest of our speakers into the spotlight so we can ask a few questions in our last uh, few minutes together. Ooh, apologies. Hi, Kit. <laughs> Didn't mean to spotlight you. Um, here we go. Uh, add spotlight. Great. Okay, so um, we 
have a lot of people who are chiming in about the Maxwell House Agata. Um, one question I really appreciated um, was from Lee, who was asking about like uh, brachot around introducing Magid, and he mentions that there isn't necessarily a bracha leading into that. Can you speak to that and like where in the Talmud or like where in Tractate Pesachim does it talk about actual blessings throughout this ritual? I, uh, if anyone sure. has a thought, I would love to not call on a, to, to, uh, Pick on one of you. This is a teacher power I didn't think I'd have. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in if people can add, because it was in the Magi piece, but Great. I'm sure anyone could answer this question. Um, many of the blessings in the Seder are connected to food. You know, when we're going to eat and they'd be blessings, we'd be saying when we when we eat. And some of them are specifically for the things that we eat uniquely to Passover. Mm -hmm. I think you're right to notice that there is no blessing for for Magid. Um, and for me, uh, so it, to answer the question, like you ha if you go through Masechah Sachim when it hits the different parts of the Seder and the foods that we eat, there's often a discussion. There can be a discussion there about what blessings you say in the Talmud. Um, there's not a specific blessing for Magid. For me, that sort of frees it up for more creativity, right? Some families... Some people are more tuned to, we have to read the text in the Haggadah that our family uses word for word, and that's what the Seder is. And sometimes that can be spiritually pleasing. I grew up in a household that the reciting and singing of the, the Haggadah that we used in our family for generations was, was joyous and fit. Um, but there's no blessing, right? It's, it's telling the story is what you're supposed to do. Um, but it there's no blessing that makes me feel like it's a more flexible ritual requirement. And that um, for those who are creative, for those who think about how you want to tell the story, um, you know, what ways do you want to engage the people at your Seder telling the story? I think the fact that that ritual doesn't have a blessing gives you more freedom to experiment and play and create. Um, and for me, it makes uh, the potential of Magi, of Magi very, um, uh, just uh, unlimited, uh, only limited by your creativity and the time that you have, um, to, you know, after you're done cooking and preparing, right? That's my lament every year. I have all these dreams about how much time I want to spend planning the Seder. And then when I'm finished cooking the last dish on my list to cook, I'm like, oh my God, the Seder's starting. I only made time for the cleaning and the cooking. And I try to start early and early every year to get the great. Well, anyways, that's, that's never... my... I'm sorry, Rabbi. No, I was done. Uh, anybody else want to add? Jump, feel free to jump in. We're on to the next question. Okay, great. Um, I'm happy, to, oh, I'm happy great. to jump in for a second. Um, oh, yeah, to just uh, say one uh, addition to what Rabbi Goldberg said, um, something I think is really interesting about Magi because we don't have a bracha over it, which means that there is more... Um, ability to expand or be creative is that the Magid is deeply Midrashic in orientation. It's a very deeply rabbinic telling, um, as we've discussed in today's talk. Um, but I think to what to say about bringing in a lot of what's there in the Haggadah, also perhaps you're not going to probably want to read the first 16, chap 15 chapters of Shmot. Um, one day, maybe that will happen for me at my Seder, but I don't think that that's going to happen to most people because that will take quite a long time. Maybe you to go back and bring some key parts of that, especially if you have people who don't have a good foundation in Pasach story, right? To kind of build on what's in the Haggadah. Because if you don't, I often find, and I've said this to folks recently, that if you don't have a very substantial rabbinic background, and when I say rabbinic background, I mean specifically in rabbinic literature, which is a kind of Jewish literature, then the Maki feel very, very impenetrable. And so I think one way to navigate that is to is to expand in ways that are aligned and congruent with the text itself. I think that there's something very, very important about retaining our story and our text, because that is the point for the, of the Seder. But I think that there are ways we can do that 
that will bring people in who might otherwise feel very disconnected. Thank you. A historical note on that, if if if, if you don't mind, Mara, if you want to. Move sure. Forward. Yes. Great. Right. Uh, there was no guarantee that the Magi would be telling the story of the Exodus from the Egypt. I mean, that seems totally and absolutely obvious. Like that's what we would do. But actually, the Tosefta, which um, uh, Judith Hauptman showed, was actually earlier than the Mishnah in Pesachim, has a different requirement, which is that instead of telling the story of the Exodus, you share, um, you you study the rules of Passover for the night, which maybe sounds a little less engaging, but I don't know, maybe for the rabbis, that's a little more engaging. And then that seems to have morphed later into telling the story of the Exodus. And as of course, as we see in the later rabbinic materials, there's a debate over how to do it. But, you know, if you're just going off the Torah, the Torah says, basically for Passover, what do you need? You need like your Paschal lamb and your bitter herbs and your matzah. And that's really... The ritual right that's really all that you're supposed to do um interestingly enough we do know of an early christian sect um of course the early christians were very were were jews and and a lot of their material uh their their ritual life was built on jewish life and so for christians easter is pascha right same word as passover it's the same festival uh there was a, a sect uh that um read the entire book of exodus on the night of Easter, and then gave a whole Christological interpretation to it, which is not what Jews would do. But anyway, there, so there is this precedent for actually reading the entire book of Exodus on the night. It probably took a very long time, though. It's a it's a pretty long book. So, thank you all. I uh, thought we might get to to more questions, but I do think uh, someone messaged me earlier, um, and I think that her uh, thought really actually threaded. Uh, our conversation and she was talking about how one of her students um, felt that the four questions were actually a way for the adults at the table who didn't know these answers to get them answered and um, you know I think that's just a really interesting take on it but uh, I, I do think we didn't plan for access to be um, a major theme of today's cover conversation um, but it does turn out that uh, the rabbis were thinking about that in their own way. Uh, Rabbi Elliot, you uh, mentioned how um, when people would go to make their sacrifices, the idea of not knowing a bracha was um, accepted to a certain degree, but it, rep repetition was really part of it. So whether you are starting your a uh, Seder ritual this year, if this is the first time you're doing a Seder, or if you uh, have been doing this in your entire life, we hope that you think about it in a different way. Um, and we are looking forward to sharing all of our sources with you via email. We'll share this recording. And of course, we'll share um, where to buy our very lovely highlights of Tractate Pesachim. Um, I'll put that in the chat. And also, if you aren't learning with us every week, at, at um, oh, excuse the background noise. Um, on Thursdays at nine thirty, it's never too late to join us. Um, we uh really love sending out our daily essays uh on uh on the daily daf. Um, and uh, we appreciate you all. We are wishing you all a very happy holiday, holiday, and uh, chag sameach, and uh, see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Chag sameach, everybody. Nice to see y'all.